So it's a massive welcome to Sarah today. Um, she could only join us this afternoon and did not want to be that person, but I did push for her to join us because she had a recruitment panel all morning. So I'm so thankful for her for, for squeezing us in and joining us today. I think it leads excellently on from what Brian was speaking about. Sarah is the Professor of Medical and Family Sociology and Head of School of Molecular Genetic and Population Health Sciences and elected Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh 2014. I'm delighted to welcome Sarah, so if you could welcome her in the usual manner, um, and I'll take, we'll, we'll share some questions at the end as well. Thanks, Sarah. All right, thanks very much. Um, thanks very much for inviting me, and I'm delighted to speak to you. I'm glad I could get here for most of uh, Brian's um, talk as well. So I'm going to talk to you about some of the work that I've been involved with, with my colleagues uh, Vari Aitken and Claudia Pagliari, as well as actually a um, group of colleagues in the School of Law, Graham Laurie and others, about work that we've been doing, well I'm only going to draw on some of it, but for a long time now, maybe at least 10 years, we've been involved in public engagement alongside some of the kind of big data projects um, that are using genetic data, health electronic health records and a range of other data um, in the College of Medicine and, and Vet Medicine. Um, and, but most recently we've been doing work with the new FAR Institute and also the Administrative Data Research Centre that involves colleagues in um, science and engineering and humanities and social science. So it's clearly pan-university issues around the massive potential of using massive amounts of data that's derived from individuals um, for research, epidemiological research, social research, and, and others. Um, and there's a great fear, I think, in some ways, around um, public reactions to this work and pub public concerns. And quite rightly, I think, as you will have discussed throughout the day, um, and certainly we heard about this afternoon, made, there are rightful concerns around privacy, confidentiality, breaches of security, etc. Um, but just before I start the talk, I should um, say that in the work that we have done, which is going out and uh, talking to a range of publics, uh, mostly qualitative um, and deliberative work, um, people have quite high expectations of us in academia, and I think that we need to be quite humble about that, um, and a, a degree of trust. So although in general I think a lot of people think there's a kind of deficit of trust um, in terms of the public and data deriving from them, their information. Um, the work that we've done would suggest that academics and doctors um, are held perhaps in rather in higher esteem than we deserve. Um, so I think that that gives us an even added responsibility to act um, on the trust that is, seems to be given to us. Um, and I should also say, that means dis uh, discussions like how secure our systems are and what we do to identify breaches um, or sloppy behaviour. Um, it's really important that we deal with those. But also our work um, or our conversations um, uh, in our deliberative events would also demonstrate that people do expect there to be breaches of security. I mean, obviously, we hear about them all the time. And no matter how secure one system is, this is, going, this is going to happen, hopefully not very often. And so that in itself doesn't remove the possibility of trust. I think it's how you deal with those breaches and kind of what, um, what would happen subsequent to that and what lessons would be learned and whether the individual or the institution involved was held to account. So I think it's quite important to, um, to say that. Um, and also, I think... Um, a major concern around that, that is identified in terms of linking data to research is if those data are anonymized, the process of de-identification, then most other concerns fall away. And our research would suggest that isn't the case. So we can't rest on the fact of anonymization. Um, so I'll talk about some of those other concerns. Now, um, but to, before that, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, public engagement. So, I guess 
everyone in information services is involved in public engagement because you have to involve everyone else in the university community in order to keep them on message, to make sure that they're doing things um, in the way that they should be doing and learning from the twists and turns that people might make in order to get round rules. So public engagement, um, I'll talk about what it is and why we promote it um, for the first part of the talk and then a little bit around some of the work that we've done on public attitudes to data linkage and data sharing, so what those key issues were, and then how public engagement should inform governance structures for and use of data linkage for research. So just three key areas. Uh, I'm, can you hear everyone at the back and not going too fast? Um, so as many of you will know, there's a, a trend, it's a kind of societal trend um, towards increased public participation in key policy areas. Um, and so a challenge, I think, is to make that participation meaningful at a number of levels, so not to be kind of tokenistic. And that involvement can take many, many different forms and quite imprecisely um, defined. And I think for those of us who are involved in public engagement in, in the research context, that is, puts us in quite a tricky position something's imprecisely defined, it means people can kind of make of it what they will in lots of ways. Um, so there's an instability of terms and concepts, meanings and goals, and I find myself and my team, we have to kind of walk a sort of tightrope between different people's expectations around what we're doing, and I'll be able to say, it's okay, carry on doing this research because the public think this. Well, we all think different things at different times, so we're never going to get such a clear, resolute so there's competing claims and demands associated with public engagement. And I suppose the slightly more sceptical or cynical um, take on that is that if you underspecify something, um, then you can keep into the frame a variety of meanings that might be quite functional in some way. So if you don't like what researchers, research on public engagement has found, you can say, well, it, the research wasn't good enough or it wasn't wide enough, didn't involve enough publics, or yes, that's interesting, but we have spoken to other people, other stakeholders, and they have priorities. So it's very difficult to establish exactly what we should be doing in public engagement, and we have we struggle with that daily, I think. But I still think it's really important to do this. Um, and why sh is it important to do it? Because decision making should take into account public attitudes, and particularly those particularly in a university setting where our, our, our mission and our whole reason for being is to improve society through education and research. So public engagement then, I suppose, could and should revitalise that academic community relationship and perhaps the whole area of data linkage, uh, everyone, information for research that could have might be a good mechanism to revitalise those relationships. Um, and so and public engagement can strengthen democratic institutions, produce better public policy, and also can extend what constitutes expertise on an issue. So uh, any of you who've been involved in public engagement, either as participants or as facilitators, will know that it really does allow mutual learning and you can begin to think of things from a different way and reframe some of these terms. So what types of engagement are there? Um, and what types of approaches do we try and take in our research? As you can imagine, in a, um, any academic area, there'll be numbers of different models that are put forward for, um, for engagement. Um, and a classic model was produced in the 1960s by Einstein that had a kind of ladder of engagement where right at the top you have the kind of most empowering forms of engagement where people are, are collectively involved in shaping a research agenda, for example, or shaping policy um, and its delivery. Right at the bottom is a kind of tokenistic approach to engagement that could even be manipulated as, as advertising um, can do or other, other forms of um, of, um, of awareness, information sharing. We have kind of tried to consolidate the literature into three different 
areas, awareness raising, which is where you provide information and public um, education, and almost everything we do has an element of information sharing. If you want to have a good dialogue about something, you need to, you need to provide information and have a discussion um, about what is happening at the moment. Um, and then another form would be um, consultation, where you generate insight into public views and opinions, and I'll report on some of our work that has done that now through a whole range of methods. Um, or something that's kind of near the top of the, uh, of the ladder of potentiality, working with the public to enable them to play a part in decision making. Much more challenging, and very challenging in the research context, where generally our way of working is um, But I think the work that we've done kind of raises the possibility that one way to deal with um, public concerns is to actually ask research questions relevant to public concern, particularly in areas of health, social care, um, which is where a lot of the work is being done in terms of data linkage. So what about public views on data linkage? As I said, we've been doing um, work on and off for um, several years now, um, and the work that I'm going to talk about was from a program called the Scottish Health Informatics Programme that across the Scottish, um, some of the Scottish universities, which has now been kind of superseded by or has, has, has become um, grown into a larger venture now, which is the Far Institute, um, that is a UK-wide um, centre in different nodes across the UK, including one at Nine Biocorter here and also at the University of Dundee. Um, so we have... Um, run focus groups and deliberative events with diverse public over, over a few years and are continuing to do that under the new FAR initiative. Um, also under the new FAR initiative we've set up a citizens panel, so it's a group of interested people, around 20, with whom we interact quite regularly um, as things are developing in relation to both the kind of technology of data linkage, the governance of data linkage and the research that Drive that, that is associated with it or will, ge will ge be generated from the linkage capabilities. We can go to and forth to our citizen groups and discuss those developments and hopefully inform those developments. So, public views on data linkage. As I said at the beginning, we have found researchers in particular are kind of fearful a little bit about what well, if we, um, that the public don't want this and we have to really be careful about how we start to engage with the public and try to get a response that says, don't do this, and then everyone's search un unravels. I don't think we need to be that fearful. Um, people's responses uh, to the idea of data linkage generally was not, a knee-jerk response wasn't a negative response, definitely depends on the purpose of the research. Um, and. So research that was about improving the quality of health care or improving quality of life through improved social, social care is considered to be something of social benefit. But there were other, type, other types of research raised more concerns, um, and particularly research that was going to result in commercial use, which is something that is quite problematic going forward, because data linkage is also a way of generating potential commercialised analytics. And so that's been an area that we are beginning to consult more widely on to try and get some understanding of, of where um, different publics would draw the line around commercial involvement. There was also a concern that research should have demonstrable benefits. So that aligns very nicely with the, um, the need for, for with, our, with our own impact agendas, I suppose but also the promise of, of benefit isn't enough to And also we found that kind of notions of trust and trustworthiness shape public responses, but they do this in quite nuanced and sometimes quite surprising ways. So I, I would have thought, I don't know about people in the room, that the use of health data is the most kind of sensitive of all, and in some ways that is what people 
bastion of privacy into your medical record. However, that is linked with the idea that anything that improves healthcare or is likely to lead to the development of better um, therapeutics um, is a good thing. So that operates almost in contradiction to the idea that this is the most personal of information. So it's the most personal, but likely to be of the most benefit if researchers can use it. Um, and that's related to a sense of trust in the medical community and as I said, the academic community. I would have thought work, um, social research using social data, housing, um, geographical um, data, social class and that type of thing would have been more readily acceptable in some ways, but we've actually found that that's not necessarily the case. And that seems to be aligned to a very uh, strong concern about the potential, even of um, anonymized data, resulting in the stigmatization of different communities, different geographic areas, different subgroups. So it's not about an individual, but actually the effect that it could have on whole groups and, and that social, social data um, and the publics that we spoke to seem to generate that concern rather more than medical data. It's not completely either or, it's the same in some areas um, in relation to medicine. Um, so it basically means the social scientists are far from off the hook in terms of thinking about how they utilize data. Consent, um, in all the work that we've done, remains a, an important issue, so it's prioritized by um, lots of people. But there was no consensus about kind of what forms of consent are necessary for what types of um, research using linked data. Um, so people would say things like, I think consent's a top priority, I would want to make more choice. Um, but then in discussions, <coughs> those views became slightly more nuanced because with um, routinely collected data or data that becomes um, um, an anonymized and, and linked, um, the idea that you would ask consent every time something, every time those data were interrogated is, is impossible. Um, so people would become more nuanced and say, well, I'd like to be asked if it's okay, or I'd like to be asked occasionally, and would come up with quite interesting um, alternatives to individual consent for every, every bit of research through maybe a kind of yearly reminder that this is the type of work that's going on, and so to kind of reify or bring to people's mind that there's a potential to opt out, which is um, the situation at the moment, being able to opt out. Um, so a, a kind of sense of a, that that relationship should be quite dynamic between the population and the researchers. Um, and just as importantly, I think, <coughs> the idea that there's a feedback loop. People, um, people wished to be informed about what was going on, whether that was directly through individual uh, being provided with information at an individual level or through greater awareness and greater ability to find out what was going on. Um, and responses, as, as always, will vary by the context um, in which people were discussing things, the, the, the cases that they might have been discussing and the amount of information provided. Um, but it, this was really important for us because in terms of data linkage, if data is anonymized, then um, individual consent isn't, um, isn't required and a go the governance model is one of authorization. Um, and there were concerns about that authorize, authorization model so it seems to take control away from individuals. And from so it's important to think about what else could be in place that would give that sense of control, try and give real control in some way. Um, there were, of course, concerns about confidentiality and privacy. We would be su um, surprised if, if there weren't those concerns. But that didn't necessarily mean that people objected to data linkage um, for research. Um, anonymization from people's point of view was clearly one way to address issues of confidentiality and privacy, but people also realized that, confidential, um, that anonymity itself takes different forms um, and that there re remains some residual potential for re-identification. Um, and the public good argument to be the ones that really resonated with the public. 
public good or socially beneficial. Um, and so again, reflecting on that for, in terms of us as researchers and perhaps for us as a whole institution, actually we need to more fully understand what is meant by public benefit and how on earth do we terms or public requirements. And some of the discussions would be around, you know, we, already, we already know things, we already know things around inequalities in health, however, we don't seem to be recognised. So the need for a kind of improved healthcare system or improved um, social welfare system would be the kind of outputs that would be expected and not necessarily ones that researchers um, can deliver. So anonymization, just before moving on, was not seen as a substitute for consent, which I think in terms of a lot of discussion in, uh, uh, around the ethics and governance would be seen as a substitute for consent. And most importantly, people wished to be informed. Which led us to say that in, in many ways the most important things for um, the wider public in terms of data linkage was having a sense of control. That they had some control ha over how their data was used, but there were different understandings about what that control would mean. And some of it would be just having greater awareness. And also that trust in the individual organisation, the individual researcher or the organisation, seemed to mean there was less need for very explicit forms of So actually building a trustworthy relationship and a transparent, trustworthy system is one way in which to deal with that to be built in a sense collaboratively, not so it becomes trans it is transparent to the wider public. We also found that people we spoke to also could take a long, a longer term view. Their responses weren't necessarily related to them as, as individuals and the potential benefit to them um, in the here and now. So there was a general support for data link, linkage in relation to service planning and care. Um, that there was a recognition of uncertainty alongside the value in terms of research. There was concern over long term implications of data link, linkage and consequences so again, this speaks to the idea that the relationship between publics and researchers around data linkage is dynamic and the field is changing. So people might be okay about something now, but actually have concerns about, well, if this accelerates or intensifies, or if there's a significant change in governments, then we might be much more concerned than we are at the moment. Um, and also that awareness raising is essential for deliberation and dialogue. So when we first spoke to people, um, the ideas are quite new. Um, and then uh, through our deliberations, they got more involved and more engaged as they were given the opportunity. But clearly, that is the starting point for any, any further forms of engagement. So just to conclude, um, there's definitely potential to try and develop much more clearly defined purposes for public engagement and then develop appropriate types of engagement in relation to the work that this university and other universities are doing around data linkage. But this must be an ongoing process, situation has changed, so it's not something you just do at the beginning and say, okay, research questions, go forth and, and multiply your research questions. Um, in, so it must be deliberative. Um, need to engage policymakers and researchers in that engagement. There has to be um, has to be a dialogue. Otherwise, the policy will con policy will continue to be made without uh, be learned from engagement. Um, and research is is increasingly required. Researchers are increasingly required to explore public views. These must be understood as dynamic and contextual, which means that there has ongoing involvement. We're never going to produce a single answer um, that says this is straightforward, once you've done this, there's nothing else to 
worry about, but it had really big changes. Always have to be part of an ongoing program um, for all the work that's being done um, on data linkage. So public engagement and participation in relation to the FAR Institute and the Administrative Data Research Centre um, centres um, is a tool of governance. It's part of the way in which our governance structures work, and we have to ensure that that, that properly feeds into scientific advisory committees and the governance structure. We're also now looking to the future to develop new modes of communication that could propel new methods of engagement, particularly social media, um, uh, and also um, citizen participation in research, citizen science um, type approaches. And this should contribute to the much wider endeavour, I think, of an engaged university. Um, and this is particularly important now, I think, in terms of universities' engagement in the generation and use of personal data, even if it is Thanks very much. Um, thanks very much, Sarah. I'm sure we have got some questions um, for Sarah. We have a few minutes for those. If you raise your... Charles, here in the front, John. Um, if somebody else wants to raise their hand, I can have them in mind as well. Um, but if we take a question from Charles. Um, thanks very much, Sarah. Um, you weren't here this morning to, to hear uh, my talk on, on privacy. Uh, and I'm not sure really how far it affects necessarily the question of data sharing for health purposes. But what I would be interested to know is um, what conception of privacy was fed into the public engagement focus groups and so on that you conducted. Because as I was talking this morning, um, there is a conception that privacy itself is a public good and has social value and that it shouldn't be construed only as a question of me and my data and my privacy versus the public good that might come from the use of that data. So I'm just wondering whether um, there is scope in the public engagement to talk about those wider conceptions of privacy which begin to take it away from simply purely the individual right or the individual value and begin to put it in on almost the same level as the public good that comes from data linkage versus, if you like, the public good that comes from protection of privacy. Um, I've got lost yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Oh, maybe it's not. Maybe I had it on mute the whole time. <laughs> maybe you're using this one. Yeah. <laughs> um, we didn't give them a version of privacy. Well, not in a not in a an obvious way. So maybe in, in, in an implicit way, but not in terms of information that we gave. So privacy is something that comes came is what people talked about. Um, but I. I think most people worked with a notion that was not just around individual privacy. So it was both of those things. It was, yes, my, you know, my medical record is my medical record and I have a sense of ownership and I have a desire to have some control, but in the process of deliberating as to what on earth that would mean in practice, people would retract from that to some extent and talk about the greater social good and to some extent the obligation that that might come with that in terms of contributing information that would help others or help um, researchers or scientists identify which parts of the country are, are, you know, have higher levels of ill health, for example. So I think people operate with that, that quite dynamic relationship, but it would be very interesting to explore that further because I th some of our data also did demonstrate this need to understand kind of collective concern so people weren't just concerned about themselves as individuals and stigma would be one clear example of that so it was con it was concerned that even that population level data or subgroups of that might be stigmatizing but it wasn't about themselves as individuals um here oh sorry here here at the front john um over um Yes, uh, thanks for the talk. It was, it was very interesting. Um, uh, is there a distinction or, or in, in your groups uh, that where you've been talking about uh, sort 
uh, certainly uh, uh, health records and, and, and patient records. Have you made a distinction between when you use those records for research uh, that's aggregated and you're trying to look at trends and you know cardiac trends or things of that nature versus when you have singled out an individual uh, and then perhaps you contact them about the, their a specific issue. Uh, do you have a different uh, level of security or a, or a different way that you process those, those two types of research? Yes, so mostly we were talking, our interest was in the former, so it's aggregated data, that's, that's what we're involved in. People would rely on those two things or have expectations that aggregated data might produce individual benefits um, and perhaps even an obligation that it should produce um, and so, um, But on the whole, people were able to separate those two the, the one that we were interested in. People did also discuss data sharing for the patients and have mixed views about that. So on the one hand, people want that sharing. On the other hand, the potential inappropriate labeling or sharing with some, some sectors, not others, might re as we would expect, but our primary interest is in We have time just for one final question. Um, I'm trying to keep an eye on hands, but... Okay. Oh, there is one. Great. Final question then, please. Is there a perceived benefit to the individual by collab uh, participating, and is there an actual benefit in terms of uh, real medical outcomes for them? Um... That depends on the research. So, you, for example, you might, one might have participated in a clinical trial and then subsequently data linkage would be used to monitor the follow-up. Um, so that you could say there could be individual benefit from that as a result of the trial. Um, new drugs would, would, would come in. Those people would have consented and likely have quite a lot of information. So, at one level, there can be But for the longer term project, less translate, translation, researchers would argue that the data might be required to help the health system benefit somewhere along the line rather than an individual benefit. You could argue that there are individual benefits around participation, and that's of a, like a different order of benefit. That's in terms of, and most people that we spoke to describe those benefits. Find out about something they didn't know about, which is more important. And I think that's an important benefit. That's superb. Thanks so much, Sarah. Can we can we thank Sarah for her involvement as well? Thank you.